Hello, this is Nicholas Briggs, and you're listening to the Sirens of Audio. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, Short Trips, Volume 11. It is with the greatest honour that I have been designated the Santaran Rearguard on Ubreus. Rear Guard. If you stopped running, you could die with honour. I'd rather not die at all, thanks. It's better to die with honour than not to die at all. Let's agree to disagree on that one. <laughs> Messages from the dead. It hurts to be sidelined. To know he won't trust me with more. He needs someone like he needed Romana. The autopilot has lost control, he bellowed. Then turn it off, Romana called. No, that would be madness, boomed the doctor as he flipped several switches and grabbed hold of the yoke. I've taken manual control. He grinned manically as he adjusted the engine output and slowly steadied the room around us. What a brilliant idea, Romana congratulated him, pretending she was oblivious to the fact that it was identical to her suggestion. The Threshold This is emergency program one. I am dead. I am the master. We're about to die. With no chance of escape, I will not die. Do you believe that striding around like that everywhere disguises your complete uncertainty as to where you are going? I'm trying to stay ahead of the spatial decoherence. Things are bad enough without us winking out of existence. Besides, she's your TARDIS. You really ought to know the way you're... Silence! Well, if you can't... Be silent, Doctor. Listen. There is... something. Something I cannot recall. It broke through in the crash. Something... Something terrible. Doctor. Death will not part us. She often thought of that first, last day. She had to, in order to load her weapon, but tried to never linger on its events. Not on when the wheezing harbinger materialized above Unity Hall, nor on when the sky splintered and the people became bodies and the bodies became dust. Not even on when she picked up the rifle that fell from broken heavens. Security guards rushed forward, but they were too late. Ignoring the ensuing panic, she aimed at the president's chest and fired. Fired and chest president's the and aim sheet. Fear of flying. A sudden shudder shook the aircraft and the skyliner dipped aggressively. An air pocket? She screamed, a short, sharp scream. Wiping her brow, the sleeve came back doused this time. She slumped back in her chair. After a moment, the doctor took off his glasses. Slipping them into his pocket, he looked around. I'd like to assuage your fears, Hawa, but you should be scared. Inside Story A short man with dark hair and a pale Panama hat smiles. Apologies, Miss Morton. I didn't mean to startle you. That's quite all right, I hear Diamina reply in my voice. I don't think these books are escapism. In fact, I believe they may hold more truths than your readers suspect. Big Finish, for the love of stories. Big Finished have just released a new box set of short trip stories. They've been uh, away from their regular release schedule for the last 12 months or so, but I'm always excited when Big Finish have some kind of Aussie connection and one of the writers is uh, a fellow Australian. So I have uh, the writer of the story Fear of Flying with me now, Paul Verhoeven. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to talk to you, mate. Um, 
you're you're in Melbourne. I'm in Tassie. Uh, but most of our listeners are in the UK. It's always the right. way, isn't it? Yes, 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 of course. And if there was anywhere I wanted to be right now, it's the UK, frankly. <laughs> exactly. You're coming from one of the most locked down cities in the world. How's things going over there at the moment? Well, they're pretty good. I mean, escapism has always been sort of a thing that I've... I mean, we're all into escapism, obviously. We're into Doctor Who. But lockdown has really kind of ramped that up to 11. It's really kind of sent it into overdrive. So, yeah, I, I've I've retreated more than ever into books and films and TV and fiction. So it was really nice to have this come out just as the lockdown was finishing. Because I actually started working on it when the lockdown started. So it's been... It's been a kind of weird gestational period, frankly. Okay, well, because most listeners in the UK won't uh, won't know too much about you, can you tell us a bit about who you are? You're quite well known here in Australia. Oh, bless you for saying so. Uh, <laughs> well, basically, I host or hosted a kids TV show on the ABC. Oh God, we shot the first season ten years ago now. It's called Steampunks, and it was very Doctor Who inspired. I mean, the whole set just looked like the inside of a TARDIS. We had big crane shots and weird cogs and exploding valves and all kinds of stuff. Um, and I was on Triple J for a couple of years, which is kind of like the, I guess, the youth station over here on the radio. Um, I've published a few books, Loose Units and Electric Blue. I hosted True Crime podcast with my dad. And whenever the whenever I have the time, I host a very, very sporadic Doctor Who podcast called The Doctor Is In, where I interview cast and crew from the show. But basically, sort of just a, a, a nerd who ping-pongs from career to career. At this point, though, I think I have to say my, my proudest career achievement has been, has been this short trip, frankly. Lots of people we speak to have kind of ADHD type bouncing all over the place. Is that is that you? Oh my god, yeah. I mean, my uh, I released a book last year during lockdown called Electric Blue, and that was um, partly about the ADHD uh, and partly about how how I think I got it from my dad. He's got the same thing, and he was a cop, so he kind of channeled his creative energies into lots of really weird places. I you know dealing with headless corpses and you know mortuaries and high speed chases. Whereas I kind of went inwards. So yeah, the ADHD has definitely been, it's definitely been a bit more kind of ramped up lately. But career wise, it is interesting because I do tend to just chase shiny objects, right? Like anything that kind of grabs my attention and appeals to me in the moment becomes an obsession. And I I know it's a keeper when I'm still obsessed with it, you know, 10, 15, 20 years later. And what's great about Doctor Who is I've never stopped kind of i've never not had a laser beam focus on this franchise which is something i'm sure you can relate to as well so you've always been a fan from a very young age my god i mean coming home from school and having my dad sit me down and make me watch tom baker i think uh seeds of doom was one of the first ones i saw or it was remembrance of the daleks i'm not sure no remembrance was sylvester mccoy genesis of the daleks right the one where he has to touch the two wires together and make that terrible choice. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So I think one of my first memories of Doctor Who, yeah, is, is being, oh, I couldn't have been older than 10, potentially. And I'm not sure if that's too young to watch Doctor Who. But yeah, ever since then, it's sort of taken seed in my head and it's it's not moved since. What was it like being a fan in the in the 90s? I was Because I think you're about 10 years younger than me. So right. my fandom was uh, going to the library, getting the Target books, uh, rec- sticking my tape recorder next to the TV and listening mm-hmm. to audio. So I guess that's why I love audio so much, uh, because I listen to the TV audio right. yeah. a lot. But uh, what was that like for you as a fan? Did you did your dad was he a fan too, and he just recorded it and put you in front of it? Is he had kind saying? of an yeah he no he had kind of an idle interest in the show, whereas for me it grabbed me straight away. I mean, we had a TV for a couple of years, you know, when I was very young, and then my parents in a fit of mania. Actually, mainly my dad. I think he was convinced he wanted us to become a little more well-read because we were spending too much time in front of the TV. So he sold it one day. There was a garage sale on and he just hauled it out of the wall and sold it. And so for about seven years, really formative years, I didn't have a television. But we were, before the TV got wrenched out of the wall, very much an ABC household you know we watched we we were only allowed to watch the abc we couldn't watch commercial television so anything that was on the abc in those formative years you know monkey magic super ted the goodies doctor who anything like that was the stuff i knew about and so we go to the abc shop down at warringah mall and i realized that a loophole was very much like you 
the BBC would release audio versions of their TV shows in little kind of, um, you know, those little plastic cases. So I would get Doctor Who stories that had basically just been recorded off the TV in high def. I listened to the whole Blackadder series for the first time. So before I saw Blackadder, I heard Blackadder. Um, and there are a bunch of other British shows, comedies, dramas that I listened to before I saw them during this period. So that when I saw them, I had this bizarre disconnect because if you're looking at Genesis of the Daleks as a cassette, you've got Tom Baker on the cover and that's it. Your brain has to populate the rest of the details itself. And I've got to be honest, a lot of that story is not audio friendly. A lot of it's just footsteps in mud, you know, the sound of screaming in the distance Occasionally, there'll be an audio cue, audio cue where Harry and you know um, Sarah Jane Smith will mention that there's poison gas coming, and you'll hear a hiss. But I think, yeah, my first interactions with audio storytelling were just sort of jury rigged recordings of visual stuff. So by the time I actually heard audio plays or audio, you know, audio dramas, it was really it felt like I was being spoon fed in a really nice way. You know, it felt like the the medium was actually taking the uh, visual, the lack of visuals into account, which was something I, I never even anticipated, really. It's interesting you mentioned Genesis of the Daleks because what you said that was on cassette, mm. that was cut down to 60 minutes uh, oh. and released on cassette. So my first experience of that story was that 60 minute cassette. So when <laughs> I finally got to see it, when yeah. it was shown on television, mm. it was very, very strange to get all those extra bits. It didn't quite seem like it was the genuine article for me because of my mm. first experience. Yeah. So that's quite bizarre. Tell us about Big Finish. Have you always listened to Big Finish from the start or is that something you discovered a bit later after they'd been established? I think back in about 2010, I was going through one of my very manic Doctor Who phases, maybe a little bit early, maybe 2007. And somebody recommended that I listen to some Big Finish and I don't remember what I listened to first. No, wait, I do. I went straight back to the start. So I've, I've listened to every single major Big Finish monthly release up until about three years ago when I got distracted. It's not that I wanted to stop listening. And then I got into the, <laughs> um, the Eighth Doctor Adventures and I, I went in hard. I went in really hard to the point where my listening to Big Finish eclipsed my consumption of the TV show. And I'm a very big fan of the show, but I think it was about the time of, I'd say, Matt Smith's second season where I basically stopped watching the show often and just listened to the audio dramas. But yeah, I've been doing Big Finish for a while. I've been evangelizing Big Finish for a long time. I mean, I've, I've been insisting for a long time that anyone who likes the show will love Big Finish. And yeah, I... <laughs> I've listened not, to so not much. Not necessarily true because, no, that, because that, that, some that. people can't cope with audio. Like uh, you've said, you had that connection with old audio shows. Mm. And I think that's what enabled you to uh, be wired to be receptive to yeah. audio drama. It's something you've got to sort of train yourself to, to, to enjoy. It's not something you can flop in front of and no. just let it wash over you. You've got to actually put a bit of work into it. It requires the listener to basically play the role of... Editor, cinematographer, casting agent, DOP, you know, it requires a lot of heavy lifting. But what's really nice is I think if you've seen Doctor Who and if you have an idea of what Doctor Who kind of looks like and feels like visually, you can do a lot of that heavy lifting yourself, which is really nice. But it is a language in the same way that when you go and see a live show, specifically, you know, stand up or whatnot, it takes work to be a good audience member. Anyone can sit there and watch a show, but a really good audience or a really good audience member realizes that it's a reciprocal thing. You know, you, you get as much as you give. The, the performer can only, can only, the performer will raise to the occasion if, if you are giving them lots and lots to work with uh, in terms of feedback. Now, it's not quite like that with Big Finish and with audio plays, but if you really put in the hard yards and try and imagine and also another thing I have to do is I basically have to turn the lights off and listen. I can't be doing anything else when I'm listening to a Big Finish. I've given Big Finish to a few people and said, maybe just go for a walk or, you know, listen while you're doing chores. But some people's brains cannot follow multiple things at once. So it does require a certain degree of attention, which you don't really have to exercise or flex when you're just slumped in front of a TV. You're right. It is a, it is a different beast, but... When I say that I've been evangelizing, I mean, what I'm trying to say to people is storyline wise, it is as good as, if not better than the TV show. I mean, storyline wise, Big Finish has a degree of ambition. 
that, I mean, there was a point back in the Eighth Doctor's monthly adventures around the Zagreus kind of era, um, which was just, I mean, the kind of long play storytelling they were doing was crazy good. And one of the reasons I love it is because you can, as many people have said, you can blow your budget on a CGI army marching towards the camera. Or you can just dump in a sound effect and let a really good actor describe it. And I would take the second a hundred times over one. Mm. Yeah, we're, we're releasing a, a podcast this week. Uh, 20th anniversary of The Chimes of Midnight was oh. released 20 years ago this month. Wonderful. And um, yeah, it was my first Big Finish experience. So, um, And that has always, always stuck with me. Small cast, but moody music, sound effects. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And mm. it is Big Finish has been my... Uh, go to for for Doctor Who for for many many years. I could argue that it's better storytelling, but it's been more consistent as well. So, especially when I was subscribing, I'd always enjoy getting those monthlies in my in my letterbox. So that was really cool. Hmm. How did you get the the gig for Big Finish in the first place? Well, I interviewed Nicholas Briggs on the Doctor Is In, and that was really fun, and we got along famously. And then my wife Tegan is uh, she was one of the regular um, regular panelists slash hosts on Whovians on the ABC. And she was she kind of hit it off with Jason Hagellery from Big Finish, and he was a guest on, on the show, and they became friends. And then he came on to The Doctor Is In, and I chatted with him. And I think at the very start of lockdown, I had the idea for a full-length Big Finish audio drama, and I was pretty sure I wanted it to be a Capaldi story, even though that was kind of prohibitive for obvious reasons. So I was sort of, I, you know, I thought, okay, let's make it an Eighth Doctor story. And I wrote it up as a, I think like a 15 page script, like an, because I've written TV and stuff like that. So I wrote it up as an actual just script script in Final Draft, and I shot it across to Jason on a whim, and he really liked it, and we had a big chat about it, and he forwarded across to the producer of the short trips, uh, that's Alfie Shaw, and Alfie and I got along famously, and we started workshopping this thing, and before long, I was finding myself writing a one-pager, like a proposal for the story, because you have to kind of break down beat by beat and make sure that it kind of gets approved by the powers that be, because, for example, you can't have the doctor hold a gun to a puppy's head, obviously. You know, just, just as, not that I put that in there, but as an example, there are certain things that the doctor cannot do, so they have to kind of vet the overall plot so that after months of writing, they don't find that you've gone down some sort of weird plot rabbit warren. <laughs> and then I wrote the thing up. I don't remember how long it took. I write very, very fast. It was the edits that took a while. It was the editing process, the kind of passing back and forth. It didn't go through too many major changes uh, throughout the process. It was pretty much finished. Some of the finessing involved Alfie or, you know, Jason or, or Tegan kind of workshopping a joke or two and kind of getting it nice and tight. And then once it was approved, I didn't see or hear anything from it. And because it was recorded during lockdown, and this was the weird part, generally speaking, you know, they'll get the cast in and there'll be cool photos of the person in the studio grinning, holding the script. But mine was recorded, I think, maybe in a closet at <laughs> Aisha's house. So I didn't really kind of... I, I, to be honest, I forgot that it existed because that's what you have to do with creative endeavors. You have so many pokers and so many fires. The only way to stay sane is to make the thing and then just forget about it because, let's be honest, the arts have been collapsing around our ears since lockdown started. And working in the arts is a flaky thing at the best of times. And to be honest, I, I would go crazy if I was trying to sort of check in and chart its progress. And then I think just before Christmas, I got contacted by a wonderful reporter whose name I forget over at Doctor Who magazine saying, hey, so I've heard the story. It's great. Uh, do you want to talk about it? And that would, let me say, that was a trip. I mean, that was an absolute trip. So I, I called him up and we did an interview on the phone. And that was when it kind of became very apparent that this thing that I'd kind of shunted out into the ocean and forgotten about for well over a year had been recorded without me knowing, had been actually recorded and edited and mastered. And now somebody over at Doct the Doctor Who magazine had listened to it and quite liked it. And at that point, I had the Christmas period to really start to get quite manic about it. And then it came out, yeah, late Feb. And now it's a real thing, which is very <laughs> odd. I mean, it's very odd. Let me tell you something. The weirdest part is hearing the opening credits and hearing David Tennant's era Doctor Who theme playing 
with my name being read over the top. I mean, that was, first of all, she got the pronunciation right, which is rare. But secondly, it was just, it, it, it became very real. And I'm used to long wind up times for production on things. I'm used to things being just taking a long time. But this felt like a freaking eternity. If I if I get to do this again, I think I now know going in that the production time of these things is long, as it should be. Interesting connection there with Aisha Antoine doing the reading, because mm. obviously she's worked with David Tennant on screen Yes, in one of my favourite episodes from the RTD era, Midnight. Yeah, Midnight's one of my favourite episodes too. And when I heard that she was reading it, let me tell you something, man, I freaked out. <laughs> because one of the great things about Midnight is, as you'll know, it's basically a play. You know, Russell T. Davies is a wonderful, wonderful writer, and I couldn't be more excited he's coming back. But one of the things he does really well is just character pieces. He just builds really great characters and puts them in these wonderful situations and lets them bounce off each other. And I hadn't meant to do this, but the parallels with Midnight and Fear of Flying are quite pronounced. I mean... You know, they're both set on what is ostensibly public transport. They're both set in one room and they both involve high pressure situations outside the cabin. I mean, and, and you know, they've both got Aisha in them. So I didn't quite mean for that to happen. But I think when Alfie told me it was Aisha, I was I was over the moon. Yeah, it's an interesting story, too. Um, what was the what was the inspiration for? It? I don't want to give anything away, but fear of flying. Is there any uh, real life experience in that title for you? I don't have a phobia, but I am an actor and I did actually get flown to an audition about 15 years ago and I had to get flown to Sydney to do, I think, an ad for a car commercial. And at that point, I was thinking about bailing because all I'd been getting were auditions for commercials. I, I hadn't gotten anything else in years. And my agent said, look, they're going to pay for the flights. We'll get you across there. And I was just on the flight, miserable, freaking out, thinking about quitting and... I think it was the fear of COVID that was sort of bubbling over and had everyone trapped indoors in Melbourne that sort of spurred the fear part. But no, I don't have a phobia of flying. I did do a lot of research into this, you know, the kind of, um, you know, the physical and psychological symptoms of a fear of flying and work those into it. But that was the inspiration. I think I have about 400 ideas a week, so I don't remember the exact moment I came up with it. But it did spring into my head pretty fully formed. I think I had the idea for the premise and then built a plot around that, and then dumped it into Final Draft, and then read it to Tegan, and she liked it. And that was that was it. That all happened over the, oh, it may have been about a day that that was done in, and then everything else kind of happened a lot slower after that. I've got to say, a Doctor Who fan would ha would be in heaven marrying someone called Tegan, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, she was actually named after <laughs> Tegan Javanka, because um, Tegan's dad had a bit of a crush on Janet Fielding, and I think they'd agreed on a different name, potentially Mary. But Tegan's told this show, this story on Whovians, actually, and they loved I think Rove couldn't stop laughing. But I think what happened was Tegan's dad was a big fan of Tegan, and then his, ma his wife was under, I think she'd taken the epidural and she was unconscious, and rather than going in and giving the proper name, Mary, I think, I don't know what he was thinking. There's some sort of brain fart. Because let's be honest, Tegan is not the nicest character in Doctor Who. She complains a lot. My Tegan doesn't. My Tegan is... She, she doesn't complain at all. But I think, yeah. And I don't even think she's seen that much of that era of Doctor Who. I interviewed Janet Fielding on the show and told her, and she was appalled. I mean, I think she actually <laughs> I can gave, imagine that. <laughs> she gave me a message to play for my father-in-law. Just to chew him out. It was great. God, it was great. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. There's some other themes in your story too. Alternate energy. Is that something that um, that you're concerned with? Oh, my God. Well, no, all we can... I mean, right now, all anyone is talking about is the planet burning. I mean, what was it, a year and a half ago, maybe, that we had the bushfires in Australia that killed incredible amounts of wildlife and... I'm not going to get into politics, but it wasn't handled very well. And I was very angry and I was feeling kind of hopeless about environmental stuff. And one of the things I like about Doctor Who is when it is a little bit hammy, but essentially very optimistic. I want a doctor who can walk into the room and have a kind of bird's eye view of a problem and find a way to fix several problems at once. So on the kind of zoomed out level, the doctor is trying to save the world in this story. But the zoomed in level is trying to save one person from something that's going on inside them. So I wanted to kind of try and marry the two and have the solution be 
you know, I'm try- I was trying to link everything together, but I like a doctor who is optimistic and I like a doctor whose story that is hopeful. And I think hopefully when you finish listening to this story, you maybe feel a little bit less bummed out about the state of the world right now. Maybe. And that was kind of my goal. So yeah, I, I'm sick of waking up doom scrolling through Twitter and feeling it's extremely depressed about the ice caps melting. And I wanted to kind of provide some sort of, you know, like emotional counterbalance to that. So hopefully I've, I've done that. Yeah. And you've done it very well too. Oh, thank you. So very good story. I can highly recommend it for anyone who's, who's listening to this. Any more in the works? You said if, but my question is when? Um, oh, I can't say anything. I, I mean, I really ca- I can't. I'd like to. Let's just say if I were to do a story, um, I'd really like it to be a big one. I mean, I'd really like to write a big one with the full cast. Because the, the thing is, okay, I got into Big Finish listening to the full length dramas with the cast and the crew and the soundtrack and the, you know, all the, all the bells and whistles. And I didn't really think short trips were my cup of tea until I started listening to them. And then it became readily apparent that they are amazing. But they have that extra level of work that we were talking about before because you're being read a story. You do have to, you know, you have to flex your imagination muscles a little bit more. I would really like to tackle the challenge of having a full cast audio drama. I mean, I really would. I've got so many ideas sitting there and that I've kind of been workshopping for very big, very ambitious stories. But I'm also really, I'm into the idea of looking at some eras of the Doctor that are kind of, you know, some of the kind of squirrely eras that haven't really been dealt with yet. I mean, yeah, I, it's really tricky kind of dodging the question in a kind of artful way. But yes, hopefully you will see some more from me uh, soon. And hopefully it's um, it's twice as big and ambitious as Fear of Flying, which I really wanted to kind of create a story that was clean and simple enough to work as a short trip. I wasn't going to try and take a really huge story arc that would be better suited to a couple of episodes and boil it down to a 38-minute story being read by a wonderful actor. That just wasn't going to, that wasn't going to fly. So I think for me, the challenge, if I come up with something longer, is to really um, take a look at the, at the scope that I could fill and try and create something appropriately kind of operatic, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It never ceases to amaze me how many different ways uh, writers try to dodge that question. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Very good. All right. Thank you so much, Paul, um, for, for having a chat with me about this. Um, uh, really good stuff and looking forward to whatever the future brings. Thank you. Wink. Thanks, mate. Bye. This has been the Sirens of Audio, episode 96, a short chat about a short trip with our guest, Paul F. Verhoeven, and your host, Wayne Bunny. Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Contact details, links to our podcast and video locations, social media, and more can be found at sirensofaudio.com. And if you want a taste of some of the lovely goodness that Big Finish can bring to your life, start off with a short trip and you'll find yourself addicted before you know it. Because audio drama 